In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll start reading in verse 2. Peter is writing and he said, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us. Would you say past tense? Has given to us. Not will give to us. Has given to us all things. How many things? 99%. All. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Here's how. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. We have to know him. If we're going to experience, you can know that these things are provided, but in order to experience them, we need to know him. It's through the knowledge of him, through knowing him, amen? By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. They're not just great promises, they're exceedingly great. They go beyond great. Isn't that awesome? That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we're entitled by God because of the price he paid to be partakers of his nature. I no longer have a sin nature. I was transformed in my spirit, man. I am as right as Jesus is right. And if you're born again, so are you. And that deal was sealed. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Tamper-proof seal. You can't change it, can't mess with it. Only you could change it, which would be a very bad decision. I don't know anybody's ever done that. Skip down to verse 12. For this reason... I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. That phrase, present truth, jumped off the page at me this morning. Just going over my note, present truth. What is that? Does that mean that, that there's a past truth and a future truth? No, he's talking about the truth that is in you, present with you. Oh. Present truth. What you have, it's, it's present with you. It's present with you. Verse 13, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent. In other words, as long as I'm alive, to stir you up by reminding you. Stir you up by reminding you. That's what I'm doing today. I'm here to stir you up by reminding you. The, we're starting a series, and we're just going to get it introduced today. It's called Be the Spark. Be the Spark. Amen. You, you see somebody who's sagging a little bit? Remember we did that default drift? Remember we, a series on that? And we, and we have these peaks of inspiration, but then there's that sag. It's like guide wires or uh, power lines. You know, there's that, there's that sag in between. You don't have to stay there. You do not have to stay there. Amen. The word stir up means to wake up out of sleep, to wake fully, and I like this one, to refresh, to refresh. That's what we need. We need to be refreshed. We don't always need a now, or excuse me, a new word. We need a now word. The word you already have will get you over. I remember hearing, who's ever heard of Marcus Bishop? They're out of Panama City. Uh, he was part of Kenneth Copeland's gang when they were doing the dry gulch videos with gospel bill and all that anyway Marcus Bishop they would go skiing snow skiing and so they go up there and they're this there's this instructor showing them in his words all these baby moves and stuff and he's they're standing over there going we've been skiing for years you know we, we're kind of you know we're, we're more intermediate not beginners and and the instructor sensed what he was what they were do, going through and so he went up to him and he said, I just finished teaching the Olympic ski team the very principles I'm teaching you because it is your grasp and your application of the basics that are going to put you over. And, and that jerked the slack right out of him. Anyway, and he, Marcus said about Kenneth Copeland, he said, he's equipment man. 
Whatever he does, he's got to get all the stuff before he does it. My dad was like that. If we're going to ride motorcycle, we've got to have all the gear. You know, that's just his, his way. But I want you to, um, well, let me say what reminding you means. This is what reminding you. It's, it's a very lengthy definition. A remembrance prompted by the Holy Spirit urging someone to recall a good memory that stimulates them to give thanks or take action. Be the spark. You're to remind people of what the Holy Spirit's already accomplished for us. Isn't that good? Thank you, Lord. Now go over to Philemon. Philemon. How many of you did your devotion in Philemon? <laughs> or Philemon. Depends on how you pronounce it. <laughs> um, yeah, this thing about the basics. I'm, I'm really passionate about this because, you know, it's a position of real weakness to exist in a place of peaks and valleys, right? Now that's just life, right? Good things happen, bad things happen. Money comes, money goes. It rains, it's sunny, right? This is just part of life. But the grasping of the basic reality, that that's not an indicator of who we are or how God feels towards us, that is those basics, right? So one of the things that I have to shake hands with is life happens, right? Because Now, if you over-philosophize the happenings of life, that everything that happens to you is a message from God, you're on the waves. It's a roller coaster. No, the truth is life happens. But he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he, we have a promise in Isaiah that says, just like I said I'd never again flood the earth, I'll never be angry with you again. So we need to get it settled in ourselves that, okay, bad stuff happened. God's not mad at me. Bad stuff happened. I don't have a bunch of sin in my life. Okay? Even if you do, you're not under the law. You're under grace. So what are we talking about? It's, it's the experience. Right? We don't have to stay under the black cloud. Right? Circumstances can come. Circumstances can go. But our experience with God can be consistent but it takes a little bit of effort. Not works, right? That's a different thing, but effort. Effort of what we believe. Amen? Uh, that, and that really is the battlefield. The battlefield is in our mind and what we believe. Amen? What we're talking about is, or, or what you just mentioned, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is a constancy. You know, it, momentum. Think of spinning a basketball. You better be faithful to keep adding momentum. As soon as you stop, it's going to, over it goes, right? So that's what we're talking about. Do what you know to do, whether you feel like it or not. The feelings will come. I love inspiration, but you can't live there. You cannot live there. That's what a lot of people do. They're trying to live in the exhilaration of inspiration, and it's fleeting at best. Amen. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. Philemon, it's just the one chapter, and we're going to look at verse 6, and it says, The sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. How many of you want your faith to be effective? Acknowledge what's already present, present truth, in you. Acknowledge it. Remind yourself of that. Thank God for it. God, I thank you I'm not an addict today. I thank you that I don't have to smoke crack today. I thank you that I don't have to drink alcohol today. I thank you I'm not an alcoholic. I used to be. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Now, you guys go over to Second Peter. I should have told you to keep your finger in Peter there. But go over to Second Peter, uh, chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I'm going to give you a couple of bullets here. If I know what I have... I don't continue looking for it. I'm holding a wireless microphone with red tape on it. I'm not going to be looking around the sanctuary for it. Why? I already possess it. You see how silly that is, right? You already have everything that pertains to life and godliness through exceedingly great and precious promises. Man, I could get excited. Am I stirring you? 
I'm getting stirred. Glory to God. Now what I do is I remind myself and rehearse to myself that truth. So what we're doing, we're going to contrast apathy or appetite. See, you can get to a place in apathy where you're no longer hungry. Uh, When you see people that are dealing with hunger and starvation, they're super, super thin, but they got these little pot bellies. What's happened is their stomach has begun to eat their other organs. It's begun to consume them from the inside, and they're no longer hungry. That is very dangerous. You get to that place, they're very close to death, okay? So what we want to do is, is cultivate the appetite. My job is to preach you hungry. I don't want to feed you where you're sitting back going, whoo, man, like you just did your third lap at the buffet, like, oh, I'm good now. No, you should leave here wanting more. Amen. And that's what the word should do. Your words were found and I ate them. There should be an appetite for the things of God. Now, contrasting with that, go to the next one. Are are we craving or complacent? Craving or complacent? You see the contrast? A lot of times people, I'm good. I'm com- That's complacent. There should be a craving in you that drives you. Now go to the next one. Desiring or dulled? Desiring or dulled? These are questions you have to you, you do your own inventory. And really, I'm talking about us being the spark. We're looking for people that need to be sparked, not, not just about us. Okay, we're looking for somebody, and I'll tell you what, that will inspire you. You want to get stirred? Start stirring somebody else. That will stir you. I remember in, um, oh, it's been a while ago. In the 90s, I was a a softball coach for a youth group, and they let one coach play. Guess who got to play? Yes, I played. And so what I would do is teach these uh, teenagers fundamentals, how to center up on a ground ball, keep their left hand so they can protect themselves from the bad hop hitting you in the face, and how to, how to you know, anticipate, move, get, you know, get your footwork going, how to wait for the ball to come down, softball, wait for it to come down, don't go up and get it, you're going to pop out, you know. So all these little fundamental things, keep your head straight when you throw the ball, don't lean over, you know, all these things. And you know what? It made me a better player. I'm like, man. You know, just focusing on those basics, those fundamentals made me a better player. And I was very aware of it. And then I was also aware that the students were watching how I played to get those fundamentals. It will stir you and make you better. Isn't that good? Glory to God. Now, before I read Second Peter, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, um, James 4, 8, we draw near to God, what? He draws near to us, okay? So we can be encouraged by this. If you find yourself with the the guy on the right, (laughs) just turn to God, right? Because I want to speak to the works thing again because I'm the type of person, my background, I have to guard myself from doing this. Okay, I got to make sure people see how hungry I am. No, no. I got to make sure people see that I'm not. No, 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 no. Have your own heart in the mirror. This is about I need to be honest with myself. I need to look at myself. I don't need to show anybody anything. Fruit speaks for itself, right? I need to be truthful. I need to do that thing that Jesus said is go into your closet where nobody can see you, right? I don't need to stand on the street corner and try to prove to anybody anything. This is about, God, am I, am I apathetic, right? That's where we need to go with this. But we also need to be careful that, okay, let's say that we find ourselves in the place of being dull or, you know, any of those other descriptions. You guys know Christianity is not Santeria, right? We don't have to climb a mountain of broken glass to please God. We don't have to eat, you know, a bunch of frogs and absorb some punishment, or here's another one. God's not going to pay my apathy with silence. All those are lies. It says in the Acts that he is as close as our breath, right? It's not like we've lost God and he's far away. 
and there's some long road back. No, just turn to him. We, we have a promise, one of those beautiful, exceedingly great promises, we'll never be forsaken, right? It is only our perception of the truth, our sensitivity to his presence, but that's not an indication of the lack of his presence. Amen? These are real important things because if you find yourself hearing this message, because this is my impulse, this is my background, I've got to guard myself against going, okay, God, I'm going to climb the mountain of broken glass. I've got to eat crow. I've got to swallow the frog. I've got to do all that. No, 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 no. It's, okay, Lord, here I am. He meets us with what we give him. Amen? Amen. You know, before we read uh, 2 Peter 3, pull up the next one, if you would. Are, are we desperate or are we distracted? Life itself can be the distraction. It really can. I, I, you know, I purpose not to glorify busy, but I changed a toilet this week, the whole toilet. I'm proud of myself. I mean, I made it to Oasis, but I was dressed to change the toilet, you know. I mean, I was in the middle of the project. And, you know, it's amazing what you can do when you have access to a few minds. Uh, Danny helped me. I called him on the phone and, and got Raphael's son. Danny's an interesting character because I knew Danny before I knew Raphael. Uh, he had come and done some work at our building. And so when I met Raphael, I'm like, I know you. I've already met you. Because he and Danny are almost identical. I mean, it's like, oh, that makes so much sense. So... Anyway, what was my point? I had a point. Uh, are you desperate? You cannot fake appetite. You can't fake desire. You can't fake the craving or being desperate. You can't fake it. You can, but it's not. It's, the real is available. You know what I mean? You're not going to stir somebody else by faking it. It's not, it's not going to work. Amen? Amen. But there's a real that's available. So we want to keep ourselves stirred by reminding ourselves of the present truth that's already present in us. Remind ourselves of that. Then we have the credibility to stir someone else. Amen. You're, you're stirred this morning. I can tell. This message is stirring me. Now, you're there in uh, 2 Peter 3. Look at verse 1. It says, Beloved, I write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So bringing things into your memory is how you stir yourself. Amen. You know, I mentioned I'm not a crack addict today. I'm reminding myself of that. That was a dark time in my life. I didn't see a way out of that. I'm crying out to God, help me. And he did. I'm not that guy today. The word apathy, just from the dictionary, means a lack of interest or enthusiasm, indifference, lethargy, boredom. Boredom. Wow. How could we hear what we're hearing today and be bored? It's possible. It's possible. You get used to it. See, what, what happens, our flesh wants entertainment, and I refuse, I don't know if you know this about me, I refuse to do anything gimmickry-wise. I'm not going to do it. I just won't. I mean, there's things you can do. You don't want to be predictable, that sort of thing. But if, if I'm in here with explosions and flash pods and all kinds of stuff to get your attention, I've got to top that. How you get them is how you're going to keep them. It's the truth. Keep yourself submitted to the truth. Faithfulness, faithful over little. Little ruler over much. Just stay faithful. That's how you win every war. Be faithful. Be consistent. Be constancy. Amen? Now go over to Matthew 13. Yeah, that is the truth that, um, you know, you've talked about it before, the conference chaser, right? That, it, man, if I can just get this superstar to lay hands on me, then I'm back on top, right? <laughs> um, you know... Again, it's like we were talking about at the front, or I think it was something I said, that you have to shake hands with the fact that this is, life happens. And, and if we're chasing that thing, I'm so thankful, so thankful. 
I used to go to a church where that's how they got people. Snow raining down, big lights, free coffee, all the things. And you know what? I remember when, I'm just a funny little story. I remember when that coffee bar went down for one week. A third of the people didn't show up the next week because the coffee was gone. Y'all, that's a problem. That is a problem. But see, that, that tells you something, right? The same thing happened when we were in the wilderness, right? Now, I get it. Some people, it's, it's hard to just go to somebody you don't know's house. Totally understand. But you find out what people are really there for, right? And that faithfulness is so important that it doesn't really matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what I see. You know, there's people, I was listening to a story uh, yesterday of um, this family I can't remember the name of the country. They walk three miles, three times a week, one way to go to church. And, you know, barefoot through the mountains, right? And that church, when you see that church, if you Google church, that's not exactly the picture you'd be thinking. It's a mud hut. It's just the building they all meet at, right? That's faithfulness. And I can assure you that those people have a joy and that they, they have that vigor that many of us are always at risk of losing, right? Because we've got to keep the first principles the first principles, right? We've got to keep those important things the, 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 the first thing or else you can become weary. You can become distracted, right? We have to keep in, you know, this is, I've been thinking about this lately, about Jesus in Revelation. You lost your first love. Right? You guys remember what church that was? Yeah. Yeah. That was their big mistake. They just forgot the first thing. What are we even here for? Why are we doing this? What started us on this journey? You know, it says in Colossians, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Right? If we lose the first principles, we've lost it all, right? And what is the thing that got us here? It's the love of God, right? But I also wanted to speak to the experience of it. You know that two-thirds of the kingdom is emotional. Romans says the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking or coffee, (laughs) but in what? Righteousness, peace, peace and joy. Two of those are experienced on the emotional plane, right? So the kingdom is something we can experience in ourselves on an emotional level. And if we're not experiencing that peace and that joy, we should ask why, right? It should concern us. Now, again, there's valleys. And how many of you know, I would love to be that guy that when you have to pay $3,000 to fix the AC in your vehicle, that you just go, well, I'm unaffected. (laughs) I would love to be that guy. How many of you, the impact just takes you a minute? There's not enough hands up. (laughs) Nobody's being honest, okay? That initial impact of life, our flesh is quick to the surface. Am I right? But we don't have to stay there. Right, like we're talking about here, there is a deeper truth. Thank you. (laughs) There is a present truth that is more real than what our flesh is experiencing. And that kingdom that lives in us can rise to the surface if we can stir ourselves. Amen. Yeah, when you're when you're talking about that, I'm thinking, you know, I should have had Julie tell the toilet story. Because, you know, I just told it like Ta-da! You know, it's to, no, no, no. She had to listen to me grunt and groan and crawl under that. I mean, it was not pretty. And, and busy steals from us. It steals from us. I'm not going to glorify busy, but you know what? I didn't have the option of saying, well, we'll just live without the toilet. Well, we have another one. No, no. It needs attention. And you know what? God provided. It was so good. You're there in uh, Matthew 13. The word apathy is not in the New Testament, 
but the word dull is, okay? And they mean the same thing. That word, uh, well, we'll get to it in a minute. Matthew 13, look at verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. In other words, Jesus is laying out stuff right in front of them, but if God doesn't show you, you will never see it. You can read the same scripture all your life, but if God doesn't hit the revelation button, you're never going to see it. Isn't that awesome? I mean, he's talking about sowing and reaping, right? He's talking about the, the parable of the sower. The Pharisees are just getting good gardening tips, you know? <laughs> Keep reading. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. Say, I have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Have you ever, ever wondered what he's talking about there? What that means? When we have a life that esteems truth, no matter how we feel, more will come. More will come. God will continue to supply you with revelation from his word. He will continue to pour it out. If we get to a place where it's, ah, I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. Pastor Wade, I heard that story. That's got to be the 28th time you've told that story. Don't get to that place. Amen? You've let something slip if you do, if you get to that place. Amen. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Remember, he said the, the person that doesn't understand the parable, Satan comes, how quick? Immediately to steal the word that was sown in their hearts. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Dullness is not a decision, it's, it's a migration. The enemy tries to migrate you into dullness. Okay? Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. If you're a person that is determined and hungry for truth, from the Word of God, present truth. I want to hear about what He did for me. I want to hear about the promises. I want to hear about those things. If that's you, more will be given. More will be given. But if you move over into this place of dullness, look out. That word dull there in the Greek, mean, it literally means thick. We use that as a derogatory, right? You're thick. You know, what do we mean? It's just not getting through, right? That's what, that's what that means. Having an insensitive heart or unfeeling. I don't want to be there. So we, see, we a lot of times Christians will poo-poo emotions. Not so. He made us this way, right? I just know that I can't ride the wave of the high exhilarated emotions all the time. I need to do what I do because I'm committed to it. Think of an Olympic athlete. When their alarm goes off at five in the morning, they're, they're not wanting to get up and drink a couple of raw eggs and then run up the stairs in Philadelphia with Rocky. You know, they're not wanting to do it in the snow, right? They have, but they have a goal. And they've committed themselves to that goal. There's days you don't want to do it. There's days you don't feel like it. We're not going to let feelings drive. But if I'll stay consistent, my feelings will be impacted. More will be given. I can't tell you... I wish I could open the top of your head and pour this revelation. There are times when I'm in a revelation. This is one of them. And it's a buzz. And believe me, I'm an expert on buzzes. I've had many buzzes. This is like none other. And and it's just, my head's tingling. My hair's sticking up. So, I mean, it's, ugh, I, I can't explain it to you, but it's a buzz. You live in this exhilaration. God the creator 
has just revealed truth to me. And I ride that wave. And, and listen, we've learned, like when we get into the anointing, we stay there. Don't be in a hurry to move on. Oh, we need something new, Pastor. No, you don't. You need this. <laughs> Brother Hagan. Some people think he wrote Mark 11, 23 and 24. No, no, he just, but he used that all the time. And people say, when are you going to teach something new? That's while he was still here. And he'd say, well, when you get this one, we'll move on, you know. <laughs> right? <laughs> Amen. If, if, if you're going, I already know that, I've already heard that, you've let it slip. You've let it, you've migra- you're migrating towards dull. Okay? Now, go over to uh, Matthew 5. I almost read that. <laughs> almost, but I checked. Um, yeah, that, that thing about uh, emotions. You know, emotions are such a useful sense, right? There's something God gave us. It's just like feeling pain, right? So often we run from pain, but you guys ever seen those kids who are born where their nerves don't work and they can't feel pain, right? That's scary, because they can really get hurt because they don't know what's happening. Emotions are like that. They tell you things, right? Now, sometimes they can tell you lies, which is why it's important to be grounded in truth. But think of it like driving. I can feel things in the steering wheel and in the seat, right? If it's really smooth and quiet, my ears and my hands, I'm having a good emotional experience. But if I'm getting this, blah, 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 that's negative. I don't like that, <laughs> right? That's telling me there's a problem. Is that useful? Now, let's pretend for a second that I said, well, that's a useful sense. I'm only going to use that sense and not my eyes to drive. That would be stupid, right? It's the same thing with life. It's not a primary driving thing, right? But it's an indicator. It can tell us things. It sure is nice when it's going well, right? So emotions, this idea, I know people, and it hurts my heart because they have convinced themselves or been convinced that they are to be these just drony robots. I feel nothing. Emotions are terrible. You know, or you hear this. When people start to get choked up, they say, I'm getting emotional. You're always emotional. Which emotion are you experiencing, right? Or we apologize for crying. We get choked up and go, I'm sorry. Isn't that weird? I find that really weird. Why would I apologize for crying? Do you apologize for laughing? (laughs) It's just really weird. Emotions are a funny thing, but they are God's idea, right? They're an expression of the heart, and they're an indicator of what's going on in us. And it's so important. So you can't discredit emotions. You know, here's another one. Um, You ever get around somebody and you just, something's off, right? And then, or you're, again, driving and something's off. And then something happens and you say this, I knew it. How did you know it? In there. All the times that we say, I knew it, It's we didn't listen to that little thing in there, right? So it's so useful. But again, it would be a mistake to 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 drive as that with that as our primary navigator in life. Right? Our primary navigator is the objective truth. Right? That those are our eyes for when we're driving, is objective truth. But the subjective, you get that wobble in the wheel, I don't know what it is, but it ain't good. And I'm glad I know now I can deal with it. Right? Hope that makes sense. (laughs) It was good. That was awesome. You're there in Matthew 5. Look at verse 6. This is in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I love this in the Amplified. It says, blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness. Isn't that awesome? Are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who actively seek right standing with God, for they will be completely satisfied. Man, who wants to be satisfied? I want to be completely satisfied. Now, here's the deal. Sometimes, like I said, if you've gotten too far in dullness, 
um, and there's not a hunger there, that, that's one of the last things where the hunger leaves. That's, a, that's the danger zone. If the hunger leaves, you're in the danger zone. The way to remedy that is start eating. Many times I'm outside working, doing something in the yard, and I just forget to eat because I'm, I'm all about the task. I want to get this done, get this done, get this done. I don't even realize I'm sweating or I'm hot. I just work, 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 work. And all of a sudden I come inside, ooh, man, I'm, I was really hot out there. You know, and then I eat something. I'm like, oh, 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 I was so hungry. It just takes one bite to get that appetite resurrected. Amen. Because you're designed for this. There, there should be there, a natural, supernatural hunger. Does that make sense? You're designed for it. Think of the physical. You're, you're designed to have this thing go off in your brain going, eat. You're hungry, right? There's a sensation that says, I need to eat. Amen. When I drive by Portillo's, I think, I need to eat. Okay? <laughs> Sorry. That's not part of the message there, but anyway. Uh, praise God. Now, in, go over to Proverbs 16, and we're coming in for a landing. But you can't fake hunger. That's what I'm trying to say. You cannot fake that. There's a real hunger that's available, and the way to get to it is take a bite. His words were found. I ate them. Decide that you're going to be a person of the Word. I am going to take this in. This is food to my spirit. Do you hear me? It may not get you bouncing off the walls, but guess what? It's right. It's nourishment for you. And if you hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, being right with him, his righteousness, you're going to be completely satisfied. Proverbs 16, look at verse 26. The person who labors, labors for himself, for his hungry mouth drives him. Hunger should be the reason we get up and go to the table and eat. There should be a divine hunger in us for the things of God. It will drive you, not in a negative way, in a positive way. Amen? In closing, I want you to go over to Hebrews 10. That, that is the truth about, you know, there have been so many times where, man, you just like weeks go by and you're just like, what happened to my life? <laughs> you know, like whole days go by and people ask you a question about what you did on a day and you're like, I'm pretty sure I'm always alive, but now I'm just here. I'm not sure what happened, right? But that is so true. You just open the word. You know, how many of you know your heart can forget? And here's what I mean by that. Um, we forget the impact of times that Jesus spoke to us, right? But, you know, it's just like a well. You know, this is something I taught a message to the teens years ago called dig a well. But all of us should know how to dig a well because, you know what, sometimes things get dry. Yeah? At our old house, that happened. The, the well just, it was dry. So, you know, what my landlord did, he dug deeper. That's the solution. You got to just go deeper. You got to know how to dig a well in your own life where you're just like, man, I'm dry, okay? How, how do I dig a well? Just that, literally open the word and start reading. And before you know it, for me, I just did this uh, yesterday. I watched, uh, I think, like two episodes of The Chosen, and then I opened the word, and now I'm just remembering my history with God. I'm remembering what he's done in my life, you know? Um, I'm, I'm, and it reminded me of when my wife and I were trying to have kids and couldn't, and now we got four, right? I just, and you start just remembering, and all of a sudden that prime, or that pump is primed, right? The hunger is there again. And here's the good part. That hunger is never satisfied, <laughs> right? And I, there's a scripture that says the, the heart of man is never satisfied. Now, often we quote that in a derogatory way. But I think that's the way God designed us. And it's because we are to pursue him and never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. And here's the good news. We're told that the love of God is beyond knowing completely. <laughs> so what an arrangement we have. We'll never be satisfied. He has no end. Perfect, right? We're just going to keep going. 
But it is that simple, is we just have to get alone, push all the works aside, right? My analogy is I'm not going to climb up a mountain of glass, but here I am, Lord, and I just start eating. And I start remembering what he's done in my life. Here's another one. I start looking at my old journals. Yes, remind yourself what he's done in your life, right? But this is the other point I wanted to make. I think um, the fast track to apathy is to be self-centered. If everything's about you, if every prophecy is about you, if every prayer is about you, if everything we do in a day is about us, it doesn't take long before we've walled ourselves into selfishness, right? That's another great way to prime that pump. Do something for somebody, right? And do something that costs you. I hope that makes sense. But I mean, don't do something like, oh, I have an extra thing that I don't want or need. I'm going to give this to somebody. That's not great. Do something that costs you. It's your day off, and you don't want to do this thing. Do it anyway. I don't really have the money. I'm going to do it anyway. I really like this thing. I'm going to give it anyway. Right? Do something that costs you. And I promise that primes the pump. Or here's just another one. Pray for people. Right? It's not bad to pray for yourself. You have needs that need to be met. But spend time praying for people. Right? That does a lot. Or uh, I'm going to give you just one more. Call somebody and just listen. Anybody ever do that? Just my goal in the phone call is to listen. That does a lot. Because a lot of people... Don't feel heard. Amen? So, we, man, you get outside of yourself and start trying to love in that sacrificial way on purpose. Man, that'll get you going too. Big time. Because then what starts to happen is you get outside of yourself and you start thanking God for what you get to be a part of. And that's fun to just go, God, thank you. I got to be a part of that when you get to watch somebody experience Jesus and you get to just get out of the way, amen, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. That's awesome. I'm thinking uh, of Kara Kohler. They're, they're vacationing today, uh, her and Sean and Kiki. Um, every week, every week, she will, while she's sitting there, she will pull up the Facebook news or live, and post it as it's happening. And she says, come to church with me. That's what we need. That, that, that makes you listen better. You know, I heard, I think it was Keith Moore years ago, when you invite somebody and they come and they're sitting by you and then you hear the pastor start to delve into their stuff without the pastor knowing about it, you're like, ooh, that's what they need to do. Ah, what's happening? You're hearing better. You hear me? I'm telling you, it works. So, Hebrews 10, look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You can count on God. He's faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up, there it is, Love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. I'm here to be stirred, but I'm also here to stir other people. See, that's, that's the provocation we're looking for. We want to provoke or stir up people to love and to good works, to, to wake them up and refresh them. Are you refreshed today? Yeah. Praise God. We're just getting started in this thing.